morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Mano Sahu and Dr. Avinash, organizing this midterm endocon 2021 for giving me this opportunity to discuss cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. The cystic lesions can either be true cyst or pseudo cysts in the pancreas, and true cysts include cystic neoplasms, polycystic disease, infective cysts such as hydrated or cystic degeneration of solid tumor. Most commonly, that we see is pen or sometimes neuroendocrine tumors. But more commonly than trosis, we see pseudocysts of the pancreas following acute and chronic pancreatitis. There are some other lesions which mimic pancreatic cyst, and these include adrenal cyst, bilioma, colloidal cyst, duplication cyst, or sometimes even an aneurysm. Let me begin with the case capsule of a 45-year-old lady who presented with abdominal pain without any history of uh, pancreatitis in the past. She had a lesion in the tail on ultrasound and CT, uh, which was cystic, and the differential diagnosis here was a cystic neoplasm or a pseudocyst. Now, this is the lesion seen in the tail of pancreas, a clear small cyst without any nodule or a fluid, a thick fluid inside. The confusion which arises in a situation like this is, are you dealing with a cystic neoplasm which caused abdominal pain, or you're dealing with acute pancreatitis which led to the development of pseudocyst? Now, the best way to determine that is to look at the imaging, which has been done within the first few days of the onset of pain. If you find there is a cyst on, on imaging, within a few days, it is more likely to be a pseudocyst, rather, uh, more likely to be a cystic neoplasm rather than a pseudocyst. Because pseudocyst should develop after about uh, a week or so uh, of acute fluid collections, and these are not well-defined. A well-defined pseudocyst obviously will take much longer maybe three to four weeks. These are the differences on history. In pseudocysts, you find a history of pancreatitis, which is absent in cystic neoplasm. First imaging, as I said, is very important. In first imaging, cyst will be absent in the case of pseudocyst, will be present in cystic neoplasm. On CT imaging, CT or MRI, it is mostly unilocular with evidence of pancreatitis, whereas the presentation is variable, depending upon, of course, the type of cyst you are dealing with and debris in case of pancreatitis will be present in the dependent part, while you can have mural nodules and separations inside a cystic neoplasm. If you analyze the cyst fluid here, you find amylase is high in pseudocyst, but maybe usually normal in cystic neoplasms. CEA is low, of course, here, and high in MCN and IPMN, and we'll discuss that. Viscosity is low in pseudocyst, but high in mucinous uh, cystic lesions. And of course, mucin is present in only cystic neoplasms. If you come to the epidemiology, about 1% of general population, depending on the age groups, might have a cystic lesion in the pancreas. In fact, autopsy studies have shown as high as 24% of autopsy uh, um, uh, uh, data showed people having pancreatic cysts. A recent MRI and CT scan series have shown uh, cystic lesions being present in 2.4 and 14% of patients. These are very high figures. Now, depending on the modality used, the, the, the prevalence of cystic lesions has been variably shown, varying from 1.2% to as high as 24% in different series from different countries. The cystic tumors of the pancreas basically are lined by an epithelium as opposed to a pseudocyst. And there are three main types of cystic lesions that I'm going to discuss today. These are serous cyst adenoma, mucinous cyst neoplasms, or MCN, and intraductal papillary mucinous tumor, or IPMN. There are rare cystic tumors that I'm not going to discuss, and I think these are basically diagnosed on histology, lymphoepithelial cyst, SNR cell cyst adenoma, lymphangioma, multicystic schwannomas, mature cystic teratoma, and hematoma. Now, coming to serous cyst adenoma, this is more common in females mainly seen in sixth and seventh decade of life in elderly females. About half of these are asymptomatic. The most common symptoms include abdominal pain, fullness in the upper abdomen, and sometimes jaundice. The typical appearance of a serous cyst adenoma is a microcystic lesion. There is no communication with pancreatic duct. Mind you, the, the letters written in, in black are the ones which are emphasizing. A stellate scar may be present, which may often be calcified. And this is a typical appearance of a serous cyst adenoma on a CT scan 
and on an MRI scan, you can see the central stellate scar there. And this is how a, a mu the serous cystadoma looks like on, on EUS, microcystic appearance, very typical of SCN. The growth rate actually is very slow in SCN. In fact, very, very slow initially, 0.6 centimeters per year. And, and, and we really don't need to worry mo most of the times because the course is benign and we have to observe these patients. And very rarely you find these patients need surgery once they become symptomatic. The malignant potential is extremely low in serous cyst adenoma. Coming to mucinous cystic neoplasms, these are seen in middle-aged females in their fifth and sixth decade of life. They're typically located in the body and tail of pancreas, and their presentation is with abdominal pain, diabetes, pancreatitis, and nowadays more often incidental uh, pickup on, on imaging. When it comes to the morphological features of MCN, these are typically macrocystic uh, in appearance. There is no communication with pancreatic duct. So SCN no communication, MCN no communication with pancreatic duct. On histology, you find ovarian stroma, and there is about 17% risk of malignancy if you take all MCN together. The diagnosis can be made on imaging, and I'll show you that, but EUS is important in diagnosing MCN. And if you analyze the fluid, it is there is mucin, amylase is normal, CAA may be high. The fluid analysis accuracy is about 40 to 60%. Nowadays, people are also recommending that fluid should be analyzed for different mutations, but these are generally under the ambit of research. And if required, one can go ahead and do uh, cyst aspiration, and I'll discuss a little bit about uh, cyst aspiration subsequently. This is a needle going into the cyst. You can see a septa here. This is a mucinous lesion, MCN in the, in the distal body of the pancreas. Many mutations have been shown uh, in, in many genes, BRAF, KRAS, CKDN, SMAD4. Molecular markers plus clinical features may classify cystic type with a fairly high sensitivity and specificity specificity, but still they are not being used uh, to, to diagnose MCN or IPMN uh, to, the, to the extent that one can recommend uh, treatment decision ba based on that. So this is a case capsule of a 32 year old lady who presented with abdominal pain for three months. Ultrasound of the abdomen showed a large cystic lesion in the body and tail of pancreas with septa. And the diagnosis of pancreatic pseudocyst was made because she presented with abdominal pain for three months and a cystic lesion was seen. Question is, what do we do? CT, MRI, or EUS? So in this case, this is a CT scan which was done, which showed a very well localized cystic lesion with multiple enhancing septa inside, right? So this is very typical of a cystic neoplasm. So if you look, compare the accuracy of MD, CT, and MRI for a small pancreatic cyst characterization, you find the Accuracy of CT in differentiating between mucinous, non-mucinous is 84%. MRI is 81%. Specific diagnosis, however, can only be given about 40% in both these cases. If you want to find out if it's an aggressive lesion or non-aggressive lesions, it's about 80%. So fairly high. In this case, because there was a confusion about pseudocyst versus, versus cystic neoplasm, we ended up doing a cyst fluid analysis and CA was more than 25,000. And the diagnosis of mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma was made and she underwent a successful surgical resection. If you look at the clinical course of mucinous cystic neoplasms, generally they are benign, but may progress to malignancy, unlike in serous cyst adenoma. And therefore surveillance is justified in these patients. Most guidelines suggest if you have a lesion less than three centimeters, or in fact, the European guidelines suggest if you have a lesion less than four centimeters, they are benign and one can only watch uh, for their increase in size or appearance of other, other high-grade lesions. And I'll discuss some, some of those lesions um, subsequently. But if you have a patient who is symptomatic or the lesion is more than four centimeters, then uh, surgery can be advised. Now coming to the third type of cystic tumors, um, 
IPMN or IPMT, intraductal papillary mucinous tumors. These are seen in elderly people, in males more than females, but maybe some series have shown about 50% males and 51 females. They arise from the duct. Now, this is important to understand that intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms arise from the pancreatic duct, and that is, and they are filled with mucin. They communicate with pancreatic duct. Now, IPMN is the only region with communicate with, with PD because they are arising from the pancreatic duct, right? They may be asymptomatic in about 30% of cases. More often they present with abdominal pain and sometimes they present with history of acute pancreatitis. There are three variants of IPMN. One is main duct, seen about 45 to 75%. Side branch IPMN, 25 to 30%, 39% and mixed type, 14%. In main duct type, the characteristic feature is a dilated NPD, and there is associated pancreatic atrophy. Branch duct IPMN is very similar to MCN, but it communicates with a branch of pancreatic duct. And that is the distinguishing feature between a branch duct IPMN and a mucinous cystic neoplasm. So this is a branch duct IPMN arising from a side branch, this is a main duct IPMN. You see main duct is dilated, filled with mucin, and is a mixed type. There is a branch duct IPMN here, but it's communicated with the main duct, which is dilated and filled with mucin. IPMN are typically located in the head of pancreas, but you can see them in, in body and tail of pancreas. For diagnosis, MRI and EUS are very useful. On endoscopy, sometimes you may see papilla having a fish mouth appearance, but that's rare. And sometimes you can see mucin being extruded out of the papillary orifice from the main pancreatic duct. And Japanese are, are quite uh, adept in doing pancreatic scopy, which may be useful. But I think today's um, MRI and EUS provide you diagnosis in, in uh, most of the cases. An example of a branch duct IPMN, you can see here, this is the main duct, which is normal size. And this is a, about four centimeter branch duct IPMN arising from a side branch uh, of, the, of the pancreatic duct. And this is an EUS appearance. You can see a dilated main duct, a large cystic lesion in the head of pancreas filled with mucin here. Now this is inspissated mucin. This is not a large solid lesion, but sometimes you see solid lesions or, or uh, intra um, cystic uh, mural nodules. Now the malignant potential of cystic neoplasm uh, largely depends on size. So if you look at look at this place, if size is less than three or four centimeter in both IPMN and MCN, hardly any patient you will find having a malignant lesion. But the moment the size increases beyond four centimeter, particularly in IPMN, now you see most patients having malignant lesion and some in the MCN also having malignant lesions. Now, you should refer to Fukuoka guidelines. This is uh, guidelines uh, advocate, presented by International Association of Pancreatology and other societies, uh, published in Pancreatology 2017. So they have categorized the features of IPMN into two categories, worrisome features or high risk features. So worrisome features are, you have a diameter of the cyst more than three centimeters, enhancing mural nodule more than five millimeters, thick and enhancing walls, main duct five to nine millimeters, elevated CA99 or growth of the lesion more than three millimeters in one year. High risk features are jaundice, enhancing mural nodule more than five millimeters or main duct more than 10 millimeters. So you have worrisome features you consider surgery depending on patient symptoms and you may consider doing EUS and FNA, but close follow-up is required. But if you have high risk features, consider surgery in most patients. So coming to the treatment of IPMN, if there is branch duct IPMN of less than three centimeters, usually the benign we should observe and patients should be under surveillance. But with the main duct IPMN, there's a very high risk of malignancy and these patients should undergo surgical resection. Prognosis is good depending on the histological type it is better for color type, but not tubular type. And surveillance is required for, for recurrence of, of the lesion, even after surgery. 
And some of these patients may actually develop pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So that's why surveillance is required in such patients after surgery for development of PDAC also. One of the questions often asked is when you are doing EUS in these patients, should I FNA or not? So the pros is that you can find fluid analysis is only about 60% accuracy, but you can take the fluid for molecular markers. The problem is that it can introduce infection and sometimes even pancreatitis. So what to do? If you have a solid lesion, then your yield increases from 44% to 78%. In addition to just fluid, if you have solid lesion within the lesion, within the cystic tumor, your yield of FNA increases. And there is, if there is a strong clinical doubt of pseudocyst, then I think FNA should be performed. So who should go for surgery? This is a large series that I have picked up, 1,800 patients, 360 patients underwent surgery. So five predictors of surgical referral were, were identified. Weight loss, solid mass within the cystic tumor, communication with MPD, multilocular macrocystic lesions, and mucin on cytology. So if you have patients who have a larger lesions where you have multilocular lesions, you have MPD which is dilated, you have solid lesions or mural, larger mural nodules within the cystic neoplasm, these are the patients who would require surgery. So in summary, I have shown you three types of cystic neoplasm. Serous cyst adenoma, mucinous cyst adenoma, and IPMN. How do you differentiate? Appearance, serous cyst adenoma, microcystic, mucinous macrocystic, IPMN macrocystic. MPD communication, no, no, only in IPMN. MPD dilatation, no, no, in main duct IPMN, MPD is dilated. So these are very simple characteristics that you will see on MRI and on EUS that will help you differentiate between these lesions. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to summarize by saying that there is increasing awareness about cystic tumors of the pancreas. They're being picked up on routine CT and MRI, even at a stage when they're asymptomatic, one should not be too worried about these lesions. They're usually small, they're usually benign. Three main types are seen, SCN, MCN, and IPMN. EUS is very helpful in the diagnosis of these, of these lesions and characterizing these lesions. For most lesions, which are less than three centimeter, the course is benign and we should observe and these patients may require surveillance with either MRI or EUS. For SCN, no surveillance is required and one should operate only when they are symptomatic. For MCN and IPMN, if they're larger than three centimeters or if they're symptomatic or there are other worrisome or high-risk features, we should consider surgery. Thank you for your kind attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Hello, my name is Dr. John DeWitt and I am Professor of Medicine at Indiana University Health Medical Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I am privileged to speak to you today about pancreatic cystic tumors and ablation with endoscopic ultrasound. These are my disclosures, uh, none of which are relevant to the lecture today. My objectives for this talk are first to list the type of pancreatic cystic tumors that we encounter and those which may be considered for ablation. Secondly, to identify the various methods that have been described most commonly for ablation by endoscopic ultrasound. Third, to review the literature of those studies that have been performed for ablation of cystic tumors of the pancreas. And finally, to discuss some potential pitfalls of treatment of tumors of the pancreas by this way. There are several different ways to classify pancreatic cystic tumors. Two of the most common are the malignant potential of the cysts and the types of cells that line the cyst. Pseudocysts by definition do not have any epithelial lining and therefore have no malignant potential. The two uh, mucinous cystic tumors of the pancreas are mucinous cystic neoplasms and intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, both of which have malignant potential. Serous cysts are lined by cuboidal epithelium and basically have no malignant potential and therefore 
what's discovered are generally only intervened on when symptoms develop. Uh, lymphoepithelial cysts are aligned by squamous epithelium and are not considered to be pre-malignant. cell cancers can be cystic and are obviously malignant. And then there are a whole group of solid tumors of the pancreas which can degenerate when they outgrow their blood supply and therefore develop both cystic and solid components. Neuroendocrine tumors and solid pseudopapular tumors are considered to be pre-malignant. Well, how do we manage pancreatic cysts? Uh, the most common guidelines that are used are the uh, Fukuoka guidelines, which were published in Pancreatology several years ago. However, there are multiple guidelines that have been published, including those from surgery and radiology societies. Generally, surveillance is recommended for low-risk cysts. These are generally cysts that are smaller than three centimeters and may not present with any symptoms or concerning imaging features. Surgery is recommended for mucinous cystic neoplasms because they are you generally considered cured with surgery. Main duct IPMNs with a duct greater than 10 or, 10 or more millimeters are recommended for surgery. And then branch duct IPMNs that develop concerning epithelial nodules, those associated with dilation of the main pancreatic duct over 10, 10 millimeters, or those associated with jaundice. EUS is recommended if the patient develops symptoms such as pancreatitis or duct stricture if the cyst rapid, rapidly enlarges, C199 increases, or there's any associated adenopathy, thickened walls, or nodule. If EUS is performed and cytology shows concerning features such as atypical cells or cancer, if the main duct is involved or a nodule develops, then surgery is recommended as well. Now, when surgery is required for the pancreas, it is important for patients to understand the morbidity and mortality that can be associated with the operations. In this slide, uh, I summarize multiple studies published over about a nine year period of time in about a thousand patients with pancreatic cysts. And as you can see, morbidity is between 20 and 36% and mortality is between zero and 7%. Uh, most commonly cited uh, literature uh, associates mortality from Whipple's uh, at about 2% and morbidity at about 30%. As you can see, length of stay is also up to uh, two weeks in these patients. So why offer EUS guided pancreatic cyst ablation? Well, for patients, there's a potential to decrease cancer risk. There's a potential to decrease costs over time. Some patients may not want to have a premalignant tumor uh, present and therefore might provide some psychological benefit if surgery is able to be avoided and ablation performed. It may avoid more invasive procedures such as surgery and potentially may improve outcomes over time. However, it is important to note that there are some potential problems from EUS guided tumor ablation. Obviously, there are complications that may arise from this procedure and I'll go into more of those later on. As with the colon or esophagus for treatment of colon polyps or barrett esophagus, there is the potential for incomplete ablation or buried cancer. However, to my knowledge, this has not been reported with the U.S. guided cyst ablation. Costs are obviously higher at the time of the procedure as opposed to surveillance since you are undergoing one or more ablation procedures as opposed to an, a radiograph in perhaps one to two years. And there's also the potential that intervention for benign pancreatic cysts may not change life expectancy or outcomes, and there are currently no studies that support this as an endpoint for cyst ablation. Well, as expected, uh, cystic tumors of the pancreas are ablated with linear EUS. Uh, this is an EUS echo endoscope with the transducer here and the needle being uh, inserted through the accessory channel. This is an oblique viewing scope uh, that images about 180 degrees uh, sagittally. Um, the end viewing scope uh, by, made by Olympus uh, is also available for therapeutic EUS. There are two principal ways to perform EUS guided pancreatic cyst ablation. The first and less commonly described is radio frequency ablation. This is the Taewong EUS RA device which is an all-in-one device which is passed through the accessory channel of the echo endoscope and is used similar to a fine needle aspiration needle. At the proximal end is a cooling device and a part that connects to the electrosurgical generator. On the distal end is a insulated tip and one of three sizes for the ablation zone, which is five, seven, or 10 millimeters in length. 
the largest series published to date on EUS guided RFA of pancreatic tumors is this one from two years ago in endoscopy. And in this study, the authors described ablation of 14 neuroendocrine tumors and 17 pancreatic cysts. The neuroendocrine tumors were about half the size of the pancreatic cysts and about three quarters of the cystic tumors had neural nodules and a quarter had thickened cyst walls. Now, the authors stratified follow-up by six months or 12 months. At the neuroendocrine tumors, they had a significant response at six months in 71% and at 12 months in 86%. Of these, 64% completely disappeared at six months and 85% at 12 months. In the cystic tumors, a significant response was seen in 65% at six months and 71% at 12 months. Disappearance or necrosis was seen in 47% at six months and 65% at 12 months. And these findings are, are incredibly encouraging uh, that a device may be used to cause radiographic uh, ablation or disappearance in over half of lesions treated at a 12 month period. Well, if we use injection to perform EUS guided ablation, how is this performed? Well, if you have a cystic tumor in the pancreas that is lined by epithelium from which malignancy may arise, if you take an EUS FNA needle and inject chemotherapy in it, if that is allowed to stay within the cystic tumor, then over time that cyst might shrink in size because there is less viable epithelium. And over time that cyst may grow smaller and eventually develop resolution as was seen by the study just published or just shown by radiofrequency ablation. Schematically, this is a diagram of an echoendoscope which is present in the stomach and into the small bowel, which is adjacent to a cystic tumor in the pancreas. With cyst ablation by EUS guided fine needle injection, a needle is placed into the cyst and the cyst contents are evacuated, as shown here. And this is performed over several minutes with either ethanol or saline. And then finally, after evacuation is finished, then chemotherapy is injected into the cyst and is left in place. At our hospital, we use a modified device, which we use typically for through the scope balloon dilation. And we use a 30 cc syringe, which is preloaded with chemotherapy that we plan on injecting for the uh, procedure. We tape this down to prevent the uh, syringe from um, flying off of the device. And we have a lure lock uh, available on the end of the syringe, which is attached to this um, plastic catheter. And this is attached to the uh, end of the uh, USF needle, which is used for the ablation. For EUS guided cyst ablation, initially there is cyst puncture. Now the initial lavage and aspiration can be performed either with saline or ethanol. In this procedure that is performed by my colleague, uh, we are using ethanol as a lavage agent. This is typically performed over a three to five minute time frame. Uh, the initial injection is followed by aspiration. Um, the aspiration and injection repetition is designed to try to expose the cyst epithelium to this agent. Uh, if ethanol is used, then it may have some toxic effects. If saline is used, it may be just to uh, destroy the cells. Now, sometimes you can get rapid denaturation um, and therefore debris. That is once, once that is finished, the uh, chemotherapy is then injected. This is me injecting the paclitaxel into the cyst. Now, we leave this in place um, and uh, do not re-aspirate the chemotherapy that we inject. Typically, these procedures take between 12 and 15 minutes uh, to perform, and therefore, they can be done under um, deep sedation uh, or conscious sedation rather than general anesthesia. Now, which pancreatic cysts should be considered for treatment with fine needle injection? At our center, we consider uh, cysts between uh, two and five centimeters in size that are mucinous or indeterminate to be considered eligible. 
We also prefer the cysts to have five or less locules present, that is, four or fewer septations, in order to optimize treatment with a lavage agent or chemotherapy to expose this to the entire cyst. Contraindications for us would include pregnancy, inability to tolerate sedation, malignant cytology, benign cysts such as serous cysts, pseudocysts, or lymphoepithelial cysts, and patients with limited life expectancy, perhaps under two years in duration. This slide shows the literature on pancreatic cyst ablation between 2005 and 2017. As you can see, the studies enrolled between 25 and 164 patients. This current one in 2017 is still the largest published to date. The cysts are generally between two and three centimeters in size, and most are mucinous cystic tumors, such as MCNs or IPMNs. A few of these are serous or pseudocysts, and because sometimes cysts are difficult to subtype, some cysts are indeterminate in these series. As you can see, the type of lavage or injectate has changed over time. The initial studies were performed with ethanol in 2005. Eventually, the Koreans added uh, paclitaxel, a chemotherapy agent, to the ethanol lavage. In 2016, Dr. Moyer added gemcitabine to paclitaxel and offered the concept that saline lavage could be considered as opposed to the ethanol lavage in an attempt to minimize potential adverse events. Complete resolution of the cyst radiographically does seem to depend on the material injected. If you use ethanol alone, it seems to be about a third. The addition of paclitaxel increases this to about 50%. The studies published in 2016 and 2017 suggested that the addition of uh, gemcitabine or this large series from Korea, that these rates may increase up to 60 or 70 percent. There are some cysts in whom there is partial resolution, that is, the cyst decreases in size but does not completely uh, go away radiographically. This can be between 10 and 40 percent. But there are some cysts also that do not appear to respond to cyst ablation. Now, as would be expected, there are adverse events with this technique. Uh, they seem to uh, depend on which material is injected. The use of ethanol alone uh, may lead to pancreatitis in between 10, I'm sorry, 2.4 and 10 percent. Abdominal pain can occur between 10 and 20 percent of patients. Now the use of saline instead of ethanol for the lavage agent uh, may decrease the rate of adverse events. Um, in this study the rate of pancreatitis was 10 percent but uh, only occurred in patients who received saline, excuse me, ethanol lavage. Now there are some very rare adverse events that may occur such as fever, intracystic bleeding, peritonitis, abscess formation, pseudocyst formation, venous thrombosis, and main pancreatic duct stricture. It is hypothesized that it's the use of ethanol that may lead to these, uh, these real, pretty rare side effects such as venous thrombosis, main, pan main pancreatic duct stricture, and abscess formation. This is a uh, picture of four U.S. Um, slides uh, of a patient who in our center in 2014 underwent ablation of a three centimeter mucin cyst with four cc's of ethanol. Uh, this was lavaged four times, followed by installation of four cc's of paclitaxel, which was left in place. This is a picture of the three centimeter pan pancreatic cyst. This is the needle in the cyst. This is uh, the treatment and this is the post-treatment picture by EUS. Now by follow-up imaging, this is the baseline scan showing a roughly three centimeter six cyst on axial and coronal view. Uh, two months after treatment, you can see the dramatic decrease in response uh, of the cyst. Uh, this measures about 10 millimeters in size on the axial view and the coronal view. Seven months after treatment, you can see that the cyst has decreased in size from three centimeters to seven millimeters down to two millimeters in size which is considered a complete response radiographically. In 2017, this important randomized trial was published asking the question, can an alcohol-free cyst ablation protocol achieve adequate cyst response rates, but perhaps minimize adverse events that are associated with the use of ethanol? And in this study, 39 patients were randomized to saline plus a chemotherapy combination of paclitaxel and gemcitabine, and 18 received an ethanol lavage followed by a chemotherapy infusion with paclitaxel and gemcitabine. In the study, 14 of the 21 who were in the saline group 
achieved a response rate of 67%, but importantly had no adverse events. In the 18 who underwent ethanol lavage plus chemotherapy, there was a response rate of 11 out of 18 or 61%, very similar to the alcohol-free regimen. However, adverse events occurred in 28% of patients, including a 6% serious adverse event rate. This was the first study that showed that we can achieve similar resolution rates without the use of alcohol, and while doing so, can minimize or eliminate potential adverse events. Currently, Dr. Moyer and I are two of the three investigators on this follow-up study called CHARM-2, which is Chemotherapy for Ablation and Resolution of Mucinous Pancreatic Cysts, a prospective randomized double-blind multicenter trial. This currently is being funded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And in this study, we are randomizing patients to alcohol plus chemotherapy versus saline plus chemotherapy with follow-up at three months for possible repeat ablation should the cyst remain uh, over 15 millimeters with an endpoint at 12 months for uh, a resolution of the cyst or determination of adverse events. This study hopes to confirm the earlier study in CHARM-1 where we found similar resolution rates without or with minimal serious adverse events. Despite the increasing amount of literature supporting the use of pancreatic cyst ablation, there are still some questions that remain about this technique. One question is which cysts are the right ones to ablate? We currently ablate cysts that are between two and five centimeters that have either four or fewer septations. It remains uncertain whether or not this is the right morphology to treat, as well as are uh, branch duct IPMNs safe lesions to treat given their connection with the main pancreatic duct. There are more agents that have been reported to be used besides uh, chemotherapy, and the question remains as to which of these are best to use. The current CHARM-2 study, which is currently enrolling, will hopefully answer the question for good about whether alcohol is required for complete ablation to minimize the risk of adverse events. Are the complications worth the benefit, given the possibility of venous thrombosis, pancreatitis, abdominal pain, and peritonitis? Is it worth it to treat these cysts if they are benign and may not ever develop into malignancy? There is more data now, particularly from Korea, up to five years that resolution is durable, but more data is needed, and ultimately a randomized trial for treatable cysts is required, comparing it to surgery to uh, complement or perhaps replace this as the best technique. So in conclusion, uh, cysts that are not necessarily those that require surgery are uh, potentially amenable to treatment with cyst ablation and do, op do offer patients the option of treatment instead of surgery or surveillance. Ablation is feasible with either RFA or injection. At the current time, uh, I recommend RFA only for solid or mixed lesions that are not amenable to ejection since we have more data currently supporting the use of fine needle injection as opposed to RFA for these lesions. But certainly, as more data becomes available about the use of RFA, this uh, recommendation may change. We currently have ablation rates of 60 to 70% with gemcitabine and paclitaxel, which is an outstanding number. We need more data on long-term use to confirm that this is durable. Ethanol does not appear to be required for achieve, to achieve ablation, and eliminating this does minimize the chance of serious adverse events. I thank you for your attention. Good morning, sir. Nice presentation. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentation. We have a we have one question, which is, how do you differentiate between cystic neoplasm and pseudocyst if the index imaging was not done or unavailable? The first episode of pancreatic disease, there's no image available. So how do you differentiate or how do you follow up these patients? That's an important question. So uh, it depends on the history of the patient, that if the patient presented with typical history of acute pancreatitis, even if you do not have the initial imaging, you can say it is likely to be a pseudocyst. Then it depends on the characteristics of the cyst on imaging. If you have features of pancreatitis, 
residual features of pancreatitis, that means pancreatic or peripancreatic inflammation, then you can suggest it is likely to be a pseudocyst. If on imaging you find typical appearance of a cystic neoplasm, for example, you have an enhancing cyst, septa, intramural nodules, and some of these intramural nodules are not in the dependent part, it is more likely to be a cystic neoplasm than a pseudocyst. So there's one question before we move ahead with the panel. So if a person comes uh, with the imaging saying the so suggestion of cystic neoplasm, how do you counsel or if they say that whether do I have a malignancy or a pre-malignant potential? What is our job and how do you convince them or we only say it's not really required to investigate more or should we say it's better that you undergo further investigation? Very important point. So I think the most important thing that as a, as a physician you should determine is what kind of cyst are you dealing with? What are the chances of being malignant at the present or in the future? So once you characterize that you're dealing with a mucinous cyst, a mucinous cyst are only two types, MCN or IPMN, then I know there is a chance of malignancy, right? If it is SCN, I would very strongly advise the patient to do nothing, just follow up. Maybe a yearly follow-up is fine. But if it is MCN or IPMN, I think size is an important criteria. If it is less than three centimeter, I would advise them, don't worry, we'll follow you up. Now follow up maybe with MRI or EUS, and that depends on the modality available and depending on the cyst features in the beginning. If it is more than three centimeter of there are worrisome features that, that I've shown you, then I would say that, okay, here is a lesion which may require intervention at a certain stage and you be under close follow-up. If on the other hand, right in the beginning, I find the lesion is having worrisome features, more than four centimeters in size, intramural nodules, thick in septa, I would advise surgery. But mind you, today these lesions are picked up more and more commonly. And if you see this slide by, shown by Dr. Witt, David was, that the surgical morbidity and mortality is also fairly high. So I would advise, as you said very rightly, that patients should be counseled very clearly that don't worry, we'll follow up. If required, we can go ahead and do intervention. Thank you, sir. Sir, what's your advice for the young endozoonologist when they come across this cyst, whether they be aggressive because they're always, you know, enthusiastic to put a needle or not. So what's your advice or message sir, for the young guys who do US. So in general, don't put in a needle. Okay. In general, that's the first advice. You should put in a needle and you should know why you are putting a needle. So first is if you're not sure about it being a pseudocyst or a cystic neoplasm, then I think needle uh, FNA is important. Second is where you know it is likely to be a cystic neoplasm, but the patient is worried. The surgeon doesn't know what to do there is a risk of surgery. Then you say, okay, let me put in a needle and find out if there are features that may suggest go for surgery. Your CA is very high, more than 250. Or some people say more than whatever, 700, 800. Or you find, you do FNA, you find atypical cells, go for surgery. So I think when there is a problem regarding decision-making, whether or not to operate, FNA is helpful. In general, no. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you for this wonderful message. I think all the guys who are listening to you, I think, should take the message. It's very clear that don't put a needle until unless you're convinced or your colleague wants it to be done. So now I would like to invite the panel. Uh, I think we have, uh, I can see only Dr. Anurag Shetty is there and uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar is there and yeah, oh, yeah, Dr. Alok Kumar is there. Hi, hi. Good morning. Welcome for this meeting. So I'll have a very quick question. Uh, it's for all of you. In your practice, uh, how, how many cases do you come across incidentally or a referred patients from your colleagues or surgeons uh, this uh, pancreatic cyst in day-to-day -day practice? First to Chandrasekhar, can you unmute and... Yeah, can you hear me, Shirin? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank, Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, we, uh, I uh, would not be able to tell you a very specific number, but I can definitely tell you that we are seeing a lot more of these cases now because a good number of them are picked up during evaluation for... Uh, non-specific abdominal pain, or uh, we have a we have a high index of suspicion wherein the patient is not getting better, has the typical symptoms of epigastric pain, uh, 
and uh, you know we go ahead and sometimes just with ultrasonography which we do almost routinely we are able to pick up uh, and uh, i think uh, with the, in the last couple of weeks we've seen around four cases uh, and the typical pattern you know the uh, middle aged female all wear mucinous cystic neoplasms and uh, we are seeing a larger number and as sir pointed out we do not routinely sample them unless uh, there is a strong suspicion those lesions that are larger than 4 cm and to convince a patient nowadays to go for a major surgery a distal pancreatectomy or in some cases a whipple is not very easy so in those situations the cyst fluid levels uh, and the cytology helps us a lot yeah. what investigation you would like to or what's the cross sectional image which you do at your place you know what is the preference of choice and why why you prefer this whether it's a ct or an mrcp or mri mrcp or you would like to just do a ct and then an us so what's your choice in your practice the ideally the first investigation should be an uh, mri with the mrcp the advantage will be we can clearly know whether there is a communication with the pancreatic duct or uh, whether there is, whether there is an uh, dilatation of the pancreatic duct which are some of the worrisome features which you are supposed to look in a pancreatic cyst so i think the ideal first imaging should be an mri with the mrcp Dr. Alok Kumar. Yes, sir. What's the in in our center? We used to find only two to three cases per month. Uh, most of them are picked up during routine, uh, incidentally during CT scan, and uh, and some of the patients may have some chronic pancreatitis history or some other things. But these incidents are more common in elderly patient who have a dyspepsia symptom or something like that, IB symptom. who are not recovering to the routine treatment and uh, go for the ct scan and get incidentally done it and usually uh, follow up them for 3 monthly or 6 monthly with uh, ultrasonography or imaging and uh, <coughs> really we do needling in them okay thank you so one more question to dr chandrasekhar arnalo so once you see a case of acute pancreatitis and a pseudo cyst in your clinical practice and you are following them up how frequently you ask them or how frequently you advise some imaging or you know how do you keep under your follow or you refer back to the primary physician oh, yeah that uh, that comes down ultimately to the patient's comfort because a good number of patients the pc are not local patients and travel so we do definitely have the local physicians involved in the routine care uh, we use uh, initially we do use uh, cross sectional imaging with ct uh, for uh, uh, evaluating these patients for un uh, understanding the degree of necrosis whether there's any acute peripancreatic collections the ct severity index whether there's any portal or splenic vein thrombosis and for all these uh, baseline evaluation uh, subsequently uh, uh, if there is a collection then we are quite happy if we have a good sonologist involved with ultrasonography we do not like to do routine uh, ct scans uh, for them but if the patient is symptomatic the size of the collection is increasing we are planning a, uh, an intervention maybe a pseudocyst or an wall of necrosis that needs to be drained then we uh, generally like to do a repeat pre procedure uh, cross sectional imaging with an ct or an mr yes. before going ahead we also use eus routinely for uh, follow up as there's no issue with radiation we have us in our center being a, a teaching hospital the cost of us is very low so we do definitely use us in the covid era we have reduced the use of us for routine surveillance uh, but uh, otherwise us was a very routinely used modality for surveillance thank you sir sir one question to promote sir sir uh, just uh, a patient with pseudo cyst on follow up because many times there is a concern of the patient and patient relatives that they get such a scan done at the local place some vague abdominal pain they do get and it's very confusing for the primary physician also and the gi guy who see you know in between once in a while so what the actual clinical practice and what exactly should be the protocol we should have and how many years we can just follow up and say that okay it's going to be been and don't worry about this it's just be part of your primary problem are you discussing about cystic neoplasm or you said pseudo cyst no so pseudo cyst first of all is cannot be malignant so forget about malignancy in pseudo cyst the earlier dictum was if you have a more than 6 cm pseudo cyst which is persisting more than 6 weeks you should intervene so that has been given up so many prospective follow up studies have shown that most of the cyst uh, the pseudo cyst may remain asymptomatic 
and gradually decrease in size over time. So the current recommendation is you should intervene if the patient is symptomatic. Now symptoms may be either abdominal pain or recurrent pain, vomitings, feeling of fullness, or sometimes failure to thrive. Or if it enlarges, it may cause also biliary obstruction. If a patient is not symptomatic or very subtle symptoms, but if you find that the cyst is increasing in size, then I think there is an indication for intervention because then there is a potential that the cyst, if it becomes more than 15, 16 centimeters, it is very large cyst, it may rupture or may develop other complications. So, so in general, do not intervene if it is asymptomatic and if it is not increasing in size, regardless of the time of follow-up. So there's one more question which says that a patient of symptomatic pseudocyst has undergone the EUS guided drainage and you follow him up, when do you re remove the stent and should we really diagnose that whether he has a pancreatic disconnect or not before removing these plastic stents? And if the patient on an imaging, subsequent imaging on an MRCP found to have that suspicion of pancreatic disconnect, then what is the plan? So in general, we remove pancreatic stents plastic stents at around six months time. In our follow-up studies of randomized trials, we have not seen any significant recurrence. The recurrence was less than 5%, even if there is pancreatic duct disconnection. So this DPDS has been overemphasized in terms of its impact on recurrence of cyst and symptoms. So recent data suggests, don't worry, we remove these stents in majority of our patients at six months time. And metal stents, of course, much earlier. Thank you, sir. I think that was well taken. Thank you very much. Thank you.